afternoon. Once again, I'm Shayan Sengupta. I'm a partner on the investment team at Multicoin. Today, I'm going to talk about decentralized physical infrastructure networks, or DPINs. I think DPINs are among the most compelling real-world use cases for crypto. The teams in this space are credibly disrupting trillion-dollar markets across sectors like compute, telecom, mobility, storage, the list goes on. We've been intimately involved in this space. We helped pioneer its inception with our work in Helium Network. And today, there are over 50 teams taking that core principle of giving out token incentives to bootstrap infrastructure and applying that to massive new markets. As a quick one-sentence precursor, you know, Deepens are physical, token incentivized networks that invert the cost structure of building out physical infrastructure. These businesses are often asset light because the infrastructure is owned and managed by a distributed network of retail contributors, and they participate in the network in exchange for ownership in that, in that network. So this ownership is uniquely enabled by crypto rails. And as such, it enables a net new form of capital formation. But the reason we're excited about these businesses is because the outcomes are sometimes unbounded. So Deepens are resource marketplaces. Marketplaces have inherent network effects, which can compound indefinitely. And the businesses in these sectors often are power law outcomes. And you can sort of see this, right? So you have a network. You have nodes joining the supply side of the network that sort of makes the product better. That attracts demand. That makes it more lucrative for no more nodes to join the supply side. There's a very powerful flywheel here. But it's delicate. You know, when you're coordinating large-scale physical infrastructure and the incentives around the individual contributors, every small decision can have these massive ripple effects that can either make or break the network. And we've studied these markets extensively. Tushar and I put out a piece a couple of weeks ago where we outlined the major considerations um, that, and, and broader design patterns that we've seen in these networks. And we narrowed it down to three. We said hardware, complexi hardware complexity, threshold scale, and demand generation. And I'll talk about these sort of recurring overarching patterns in more detail in a second. But I think it's worth it to sort of take a look at a selection of some of the businesses that have made trade-offs along these spectrums over the last few years. And so if you sort of look at this list, what stands out most is the sheer ambition of these projects. There are, these are small startups that are going directly after massive incumbents in huge markets that all have some sort of structural unfair advantage due to their scale. Telcos through regulatory capture, hyperscalers like AWS and GCP through bundled software offerings. Crypto is very much arming the rebels against the feudal overlords in this case. And the teams treading new ground in this space are learning valuable lessons on scaling this net new business model. But I think we are just scratching the surface of what's possible here. Ultimately, Deepens are solving a coordination problem. How do we align incentives across geographically distributed coalitions of people to come together and build useful infrastructure? Carl spent some time talking about the importance of standards earlier today, but standards don't just apply to financial markets and software. Standards exist in the physical world across a number of processes that we usually take for granted. The physical world is a lot more complex than software because it's not deterministic. There are myriad stakeholders with competing interests dealing with age-old regulations, accounting processes. The importance of standards is, is even more pronounced in these markets. And so my thesis is as follows. Standards are the substrate for all coordination, and the larger the surface area for that coordination, the more standards are important. Standards are only ossify when there is an incentive to ossify, and ownership is the most powerful incentive. So ownership creates standards. And we believe that the next generation of deepened projects will tackle even larger markets through incentives in the form of token ownership to drive standards that make coordination in the physical world easier. These businesses are going to create and capture huge swaths of value. And so I want to kind of step back from crypto for a minute and talk about what I consider one of the most interesting businesses in the world. It's a company called Flexport. And if you're not familiar with Flexport, Flexport is functionally like a protocol layer for global trade, specifically for ocean freight. And so if you think about a piece of cargo that's going from one part of the world to another, it changes hands about 18 times, right? Between customs and dock appointments and matching loads for suppliers and consolidating cargo. These processes are insanely archaic 
and unfortunately outside the scope of this talk. But the reason Flexport exists is to try and digitize some of that so that coordination becomes easier across all these stakeholders. So they're basically building like this data layer that onboards each stakeholder one by one, creates like this bit representation of a process, and then they want to make that repeatable for a bunch of other people. Global trade is half of global GDP. The coordination layer around global trade, which people call logistics, is about 10% of global GDP. So the, the real meat and potatoes of their business is this coordination layer. The fun fact, the shipping container standard, which is 40 feet, only became a standard after governments incent incentivized the, the people manufacturing the ships to build it along that. So there's a precedent of incentives driving standards long before crypto. Governments are the original sort of airdrop protocols. And so what I'm going to do for the rest of this talk is sort of like a fun exercise to try and spec out from scratch a net new deepen protocol that targets a large coordination problem in the real world. And then we're going to try and run that network, this hypothetical network, through the framework that Tushar and I laid out in our piece um, last week. And so we're going to look at the $800 billion road freight industry in the US through Trucker Network, a crypto native road freight brokerage. This doesn't exist. Don't ask me afterwards whether we invest in this or not. <laughs> All right. So this is a massive oversimplification of what the supply chain looks like. I really want you to just focus on the area in the pink rectangle. Um, there's two stakeholders here that you need to care about, a shipper and a carrier. And the one sentence on each of them is, a shipper is anyone who wants a large amount of some good, not parcels, not UPS packages, FedEx packages, you know, manufacturing, consumer electronics, agriculture, really huge amounts of things to move from one part of the US to another. And the carrier is sort of the company that operates the vehicles that get the, thing, get the stuff from one part to another. So these are usually these massive class eight heavy duty trucks that are transporting this, um, these goods from one part of the world to another. And so this is where it gets interesting. The carrier market structure in the US is unbelievably fragmented. The majority of carriers in the US are small, um, owner-operated, small to medium-sized businesses. Not, something like 92% of them have less than six trucks, 98% have less than 20 trucks. Um, the profile of the person running this business is as close to a retail user, an average person as it gets. And so here's the setup of the problem, right? Shippers need to find carriers to transport goods, but given how fragmented the market is across each of these, how do they do that? And the answer is in extremely unsophisticated ways. The vast majority of carriers work with a handful of shippers that they have prior relationships with. Um, some of them will use third-party logistics companies and use freight brokers and such, but the way the market is structured is that most volume is favored for larger carriers and larger suppliers. But for the rest, for the vast majority of the market, there is this manual human coordination um, kind of archaic process around having relationships and knowing people that informs that process, that matching process. Um, and that leads to illiquid markets with poor price discovery. It's like swapping barrels of oil instead of trading them on electronic exchange. This leads to idle capacity for carriers. It leads to less consumer choice for the shipper. You know, in an ideal world, you'd have deep liquidity across a bunch of carriers along with the trust and reputation guarantees that you need in order to put the cargo in a stranger's truck. And so naturally, you know, other people have come to this conclusion, and they've built these sort of tech-enabled marketplaces, um, Uber Freight, Convoy, JB360. These are all sort of consumer products that try to you know, match shippers with carriers, but it just doesn't seem to be working. There are way too many carriers across way too many regions with too little incentive to adopt a homogenous standard. It's much easier to just call up someone you know and you know, see what you can get. And so these competitors are you know, trying to bring this industry into the current century by consolidating and trying to you know, create standards together. And it sort of proves that building liquidity at scale takes securing buy-in, in, in, especially in the face of like a massively fragmented market with a bunch of legacy actors um, that are averse to tech. It's not a simple problem. And kind of the implications of that are that there's a massive underserved middle to long tail of full truckloads in the landmass of the US, which leads to inefficient delivery markets, lower margins for everyone involved, just not ideal. And so just before we go into start specking out the actual protocol, which we'll, be, which we'll do in a second, I want to talk about kind of the size of the prize here. This is 
sort of for every dollar that flows between these entities, there's something called a coordination spread here, which is the people who do the matching are able to get 10 to 20% of that. And so this is a fairly you know, meaty chunk of change, 80 to $100 billion market that you can go after if you do this well. And so as we start thinking about how to solve this, right, there are a few jobs to be done. Discovery and curation refers to just building liquidity on the supply and the demand side, getting a bunch of shippers, getting a bunch of carriers, making sure they know how to talk to each other. That's sort of the, the, the table stakes. What you want to also build is a trust and reputation layer, which gives shippers the notion of confidence that they're not putting their cargo in a stranger's vehicle. And sort of the, the last thing is payments, you know, just wanting to take some friction out of that whole payout process. That's crypto's bread and butter. That's, that's helpful. And so here's the thesis statement. Tokens create a structurally lower cost of acquisition for carriers. That allows the network to build supply among carriers and then aggregate demand from shippers then you have more transactions which create this base for a trust and reputation framework. And over time, you have this protocol with a bunch of rich state around these, this specific type of liquidity that you can build interesting new products on top of, top of. And so step one is give out tokens to truckers. Step two is once you have threshold supply, start engaging the demand side, get a bunch of shippers on. Step three is continue vo volume of transactions and start expanding to new markets and building out those trust and reputation primitives. And step four is make sure other people can build on that protocol and you know, do interesting things with it to, to make sure the standard kind of continues to exist. And so the real takeaway here is ownership in the network incentivizes usage of the product and the protocol. And that's what drives the standard of a unified global order book. And so we described a product and a protocol. People don't touch protocols. They deal with consumer products. We had, you know, to bring it sort of back down to reality, you sort of have to build a you know, basic table stakes consumer product. It should sort of map onto the form factor for some of the products I described before. But you need to create some of the apps and the dashboards that these participants are using. These are only useful products when both sides of the marketplace are able to use them. So you want to make sure that you have an application that's built well. But again, the reason to use it is ownership. Ownership in the network is what incentivizes usage of the product and the protocol. And then for the protocol itself, right, we described a very basic function, which is sort of matching. But over time, you can do much more sophisticated things there. You want to layer on elements of the protocol that create re the, re the, reifying fact the reifying processes to make sure that people want to keep coming back and using it, right? And so a lot of this is going to be in-house in early stages, like. If someone is building this, they're going to construct the applications themselves. But over time, you're not going to be able to handle everything yourself. And that's what open protocols are for, right? You want to create incentives for other people to build on top of them. Uh, so open APIs for other DFMs to plug into, incentives to operate new markets, new dispute resolution processes. We can, you know, this, 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 this could go on for another 10 bullets. But, you know, it's really just a function of, like, adding more utility at the protocol layer um, to, to get people interested and keep using it. And so to sort of tie this back with the considerations we outlined in our piece, we essentially outlined three considerations, hardware complexity, threshold scale, and demand generation. And they sort of answered a few basic questions. The hardware question is around how easy is it to set up a node? Do I need dedicated hardware? Who makes that hardware? How much engagement do you need from me as a contributor to the network? Threshold scale effectively refers to how many nodes do I need in order to start selling the product? Demand generation refers to who should sell the product. Should I sell it? Should someone else sell it? What kind of services can I provide there? All the deepen teams you've seen so far have made trade-offs at a certain point on these spectrums. Um, but they are not static points. These things move over time. And so just to talk about where, you know, run, running it through the framework, right? Generally speaking, deepen networks scale fastest when the complexity of the installation is low enough that regular people can, can onboard. The contributor in this case is a carrier, and as we saw, their profile aligns pretty strongly with that of a retail actor. That means you want to give out a good number of incentives. Tapping into latent supply without the need for dedicated hardware means you can scale this network pretty fast. And while this is active engagement, and we wrote in that piece that active engagement kind of makes it hard to scale these networks, um, it's not materially disruptive to the behavior of the contributor, right? So there's always nuances in terms of like each of these things. But the takeaway here is that you want to be really, really aggressive with incentives at the beginning, just to bootstrap a lot of supply, just given the profile and the configuration of the hardware. On threshold scale, inherently location-specific, like most networks of its kind, you want to capture a local market with real density, um, heavy token incentives, targeted contribution-specific, 
Um, over time, you can taper that out, but you have to be generous. Um, and last is on demand gen, right? Like we described this application layer at first, but again, the degree of variance in the services layer across payments and insurance and customs and all of these things means that you need an open ecosystem of people to build on top of it. And so you want to carve out some token incentives for that to see if that, that works out. And so you map this on to the final takeaways here, right? Like the, the shape of the emissions curve, um, just wrapping it all together, looks something like this. You want to be very aggressive at the beginning and then aggressive for supply side contributors and then taper off once you have threshold scale. And then in parallel, you start ramping up uh, demand generation incentive to start tapping into that built up supply. And there's various other configurations of this, but this is generally how you want to start. The real takeaway here is that once you have a standards problem solved, you can focus on customer obsession and the application layer. That's the only thing that matters, right? Different teams are going to build different products to own different aspects of the customer relationship. The vision here is that Trucker is the coordination layer between them. Um, and so you'll have businesses in asset finance and carrier insurance and tax and compliance all on this global standard. So this has obviously been a wild oversimplification of what is undoubtedly a complex, varied market structure. The point is not that this construction w makes sense or will solve all the problems in the space. It's intended to be an illustration of the types of coordination problems that map well to crypto native capital formation. The opportunity for deep in founders is to dig deep and tackle messy real world interactions because that's ultimately where value gets created and captured. So when you have standards in place, composability and permissionless innovation become possible. This is the world we're excited about. These are the kinds of teams that we want to see um, building new primitives in the space. That's it from me. Thank you.